call to worship this morning is from the book of Psalms, chapter 9, starting in verse 1. This is the word of God. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. For you've maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. You've rebuked the nations. You've made the wicked perish. You've blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He's established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the people his deeds. Our Father and God, we proclaim this as true, that every enemy of your purposes on the world is given only 100 years or less. And then they fade away and are forgotten. Their work crumbles in his ashes and dust in a generation. So God, we thank you for your purposes on the earth, that it is your son, your king that sits enthroned and who cannot be removed, whose kingdom cannot be destroyed or taken by any human hand. God, we thank you that your son is reigning on high over us now, and we pray that he would be honored by our worship and you would fill our hearts with gladness, and that in that gladness, we would praise that the overflow of our gladness would result in praise, and you would be glorified and our hearts built up. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have a time of prayer this morning, I want to intentionally pray about uh, two particular things, which um, didn't necessarily plan on having them on my heart on the same day, but I was you know, just particularly thinking about um, the um, oh, Pride Month and um, all of the attention that that gets. And my, my normal instinct with those sorts of things is actually not to say a lot about them um, because I don't feel like I should have to just because somebody said somewhere that it's Pride Month. Um, I don't. I don't like when the culture starts to try to think they can control what we when when we start to comment on things, but let them come up in the word and address them as they come up in the word. And yet, it's just such an onslaught this year. It seems like, and and then that got to me thinking about all of those folks that are in our lives and um, have wildly different ethics on this matter than 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 we do. Of course, here at the here at Discovery Church, we. We are actually proud of what the Bible teaches. We are proud of that God made men the way he made them and women the way he made them and marriage to be between one man and, and one woman. That is what we are proud of, and we're, we're happy to echo the, the scriptures uh, in that regard. But at the same time, we, we have people in our lives that have wildly different uh, views on this, on this matter, and it, and it pains us to see them far uh, from the Lord uh, in this way. Uh, to see just <clears throat> um, large-scale sexual brokenness um, uh, lived out in, um, in the lives of our friends and our, and our family. And so I just want to pray particularly that we would be encouraged to continue holding firm to what the Bible says, but simultaneously having like this really deep and abiding love for those who are experiencing that kind of brokenness and need that kind of healing. Um, and then simultaneously, it's Father's Day, and so I want to pray for dads. I know that Father's Day, I mean, for me, I know I'm going to be reflecting on, on uh, the loss of my own father today. And so it'll be sweet because I am a dad, but it'll be hard because I miss my dad. Um, some of us are going to be experiencing the same kinds of bitter sweetness today, and we want to lift you guys up in prayer. And plus, it's a, it's a spiritual battle to be a dad. You are uh, the defender of your home against the onslaught of, of the lies of the devil, and um, and you've got grandkids probably. If, you know, if your if your if your kids are grown and gone, you've got grandkids 
that as a, as a grandfather, you want to see them raised and nourished by the truth of God. And so we want to we wanna pray for you and, uh, in, that, in that light. I want to continue to pray for Dawn Heron as, as she's um, dealing with the, you know, the, all of the affairs that have to be put into order after the passing of her mom. And pray for uh, Rod, uh, Dawn's brother, as well as they just grieve the loss of, of their mom. And we want to continue to pray for the Robinson family as well. So... Would you join me as we lift these things to the Lord? Our Father and God, uh, we acknowledge you as the one who uh, gives us our times and our seasons. You, you have uh, put us in the country that you've put us in, in the family that you've put us in, in the exact time that you put us in. And so because our seasons and our times and our places are under your authority, we know we are in this time according to your purpose and your plan and, and to shine as lights. And so we pray that we would. God, as, as, we, as we live in this culture that um, defines, um, the, the, defines their entire human identity, around sexuality rather than around Christ. Uh, we ache to see our culture delivered and freed from that kind of um, fragile identity and, and, and experience the stability and the freedom and the grace that comes from being uh, your child through faith in Christ. God, we know this touches the lives of many people that we dearly love and that we cross path with cross paths with, maybe even daily. And so, God, we pray for not only wisdom for speaking the truth, but also wisdom for showing gospel-saturated love, uh, that we would be these perplexing people that, that continually disagree with the way the world thinks and yet simultaneously is known for loving and serving those who are different than us. And provoking questions about you know, why do you have this hope in you? Why do you believe this this way and you seem so free and you seem so happy and you seem so joyful in ways that don't have anything to do with your circumstances and I pray that those kinds of conversations would happen with people who uh, don't don't know you the way the way you've graciously allowed us to know you. So, God, we, we pray for encouragement for those even experiencing confusion in this department or having family experiencing uh, unwanted sexual desire and that we, would too, would have a, a ministry to walk with folks that feel one way, but they don't want to feel that way anymore, and they want to follow the Lord and experience uh, that kind of um, liberty. So, God, we pray that we would all of us grow in our ability to say no to temptation and no to the pressures of the world and uh, live instead in the world uh, with gladness of heart and, and love for neighbor. I pray for dads today, Lord. I pray that the fatherless would know you as their heavenly father, that fathers who may be experiencing right now even estrangement or strain with their kids would, would know the grace of their Heavenly Father, that where there has been failure or sin in our past as fathers, we would know and experience the forgiving grace of Jesus Christ. And we pray for our dads and our granddads to be guardians of the truth and be generous and glad and open-hearted and pillars of fatherly wisdom. Would you bless us with dads? and granddads that are like that. God, we thank you for um, the life of Dawn's mother, and we pray for your surprising comforts to be on them as they continue to arrange for the final gathering and, and memorial. And give both Dawn and, and Rod and their siblings comforts that surprise them. Uh, surprise them with your capacity to comfort and bring grace into that whole situation. We lift the Robinson family to you as well. 
We thank you for Tracy's life, and we pray that you would give surprising comfort to Mike and Braden and Ronan, and that you'd give us spiritual gifts for caring for them well. God, as we give now, we pray that we would do so in the way that you give as a father, generous, open-handed, open-hearted, and that we'd bring you honor as we sing. In Jesus' name. Children may come up for the children's message. All right, so today, uh, the chapter we're going to read in this book, the Radical Book for Kids, is about friendship. And friendship is one of the most wonderful things that God has ever created. But just like anything else, it's also something that, that Satan can take and twist and, and make into something it wasn't originally meant to be. Um, and so I'm going to read the chapter in a second. But uh, in this book, they once in a while have these sort of neat pop-out sections that just kind of have a little extra information, and so I'm going to go ahead and read that first. Did you know, warning, the Bible warns us that we become like the people we hang out with, 1 Corinthians 15.33. So be careful how you pick your friends. The Lord reminds us to watch out for people who are angry, who steal, who reject God's ways, who live in arrogance, who stir up trouble, who love to gossip. So the thing about friendship is it will have an impact on you, and it will have an impact on them. And friendship means you have a chance to influence someone for good or for bad. You know, I'm a dad, and today's Father's Day, and I have to admit that I'm very thankful that some of the best things I see in my kids, I see in myself, and I see in my wife. But I also have to very sadly admit <laughs> that some of my kids have picked up on some of my bad stuff, too. Right? And friends are very similar, too. That's to say it nicely, my best. <laughs> um, so with that said, best friends, best friends forever, BFF. I don't know if that's still a thing. Is BFF still a thing? Yeah, that is. Katura says it is. All right. You may have 978 friends on social media, but what kind of friend are you in real life? The basics of being a friend are not complicated. If you want a friend, be a friend, but what is friendship all about? Well, friendship comes from God. God has always, through all eternity, been in relationship within the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have always been united as one. Since we're made in God's image, we have the same characteristic, the same quality. We, like God, want to be in relationship with others. That's how God designed us. God created Eve for Adam because it is not good for man to be alone. Friendship comes naturally. The Bible talks about a close friend as someone who is as your own soul. Deuteronomy 13.6. David, yes, the David who killed Goliath became best friends with King Saul's son, Jonathan. 1 Samuel 18.1 says the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. They were very, very close. Friendships don't always form instantly the first time you meet someone, but friendships aren't rocket science either. Here are some first steps to remember about making friends. First, don't try to force someone to be a friend. Second, pray that God would give you a friend who loves Jesus. Three, enjoy the people around you. Stop trying to find a friend. Instead, just be a friend. And guys, that is one of the main ones, and that's one that adults really need to know really well too. Next, concentrate on making choices that please God. Fifth, enjoy your friendship with God most of all. Also very, very important. All right, friendship comes with responsibilities. So you want to be a friend. What does a friend look like? What does a friend do? The Bible teaches that friends take responsibility to help each other. A friend loves and serves in good times and bad times. A friend takes time with the other person and talks to them openly. A friend encourages the other person to be more like Jesus. A friend is not easily offended or easily hurt. A friend uses words to build up, not to tear down or to gossip about others. And so, of course, a good thing to do is to consider what kind of friend you want to grow up to be 
and for us older folks to think about what kind of friend we are. Now one thing about this chapter, uh, the reason I picked it out is because uh, we started our small groups now and we're going through gospel-centered community. And one way to think about that book that we're going through in our small groups is that's one of the things it teaches us to do, is be good friends, to be good church members who know how to love one another very well with the gospel. Uh, so uh, those are still available, guys, for anyone who would be interested in joining one this summer. Uh, feel free to reach out to me or Corey, but hey, let's pray. Can we sit here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm such a good dad. She just loves me so much. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Father God, uh, we thank you uh, first and foremost that you are the best dad and the best friend. Um, in all the ways that humans fail, in all the ways that we ourselves fail, you never do. And so, Father, I pray for all these kids here, God, that they would uh, be so thankful uh, for the dads that they have, or thankful for the parents or the guardians that they have. Uh, but, Father, I pray even more, Lord, that they would know you as Father and that they would be very, very thankful uh, that you are their Father. Um, help us to grow, to be more like Jesus. Help us to love each other well. Um, help us to have our eyes open that we might see where we fall short and that we might repent and uh, love better in the future. And we pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you this morning to turn in them to the Gospel of John, chapter 9. John, chapter 9. As you're turning there, let me tell you a little bit about an old poet named William Ernest Henley. Uh, Henley was a late 19th century uh, poet who faced a great deal of suffering in his life. Uh, his father died when he was just a boy. At 12 years old, he was diagnosed with juvenile arthritis and tuberculosis, and uh, the chronic nature of this particular these particular illnesses would actually lead him to have to get a, one of his legs amputated. Uh, later in life, he even lost his daughter uh, to uh, childhood illness. But the really great tragedy uh, was not any of these things. It was how, actually, he viewed his suffering. That was the tragedy. The greatest tragedy, in my mind, in his life was not any of the particular sufferings that he endured, it was how he viewed them. Uh, he wrote about his view of his suffering in the extremely popular poem, Invictus. Just listen to how his poem reveals what he thought and how he thought about his suffering. It goes, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstances, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now, on the one hand, this is probably a better response to suffering than self-pity. But I want you to think about what he's saying here. Listen particularly, not for whether or not you think the poem is true, think instead about whether it's good news. Is this good news, the way he views his suffering? So he says, I thank whatever gods may be, right? And that's, that's a discouraging start, a foundation of uncertainty. And he says, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Now, I know what he's trying to say is that Life can't get him down. But here's the thing, like my unconquerable soul. Hmm, is your soul really unconquerable? Or are we actually held in bondage by things that are beyond our 
power to set us free from? Or what if our soul actually needs to be conquered by something or someone supremely good? Either way, you don't know for sure because you don't know if there is anything good or transcendent over you or your suffering. And he talks about the bludgeonings of chance. And I, that's quite an image that our circumstances bludgeon us like muggers in an alley, but it's all up to chance. No one is overseeing it. No one is up there able or willing to intervene. We could go on through the poem, but hopefully you see what I'm getting at. There, there's a way to face our suffering on this side of eternity with a certain kind of toughness that sounds really nice in a poem, like, I am the master of my fate, but at its root has no foundation or assurance of what's beyond us, that all of our circumstances are up to cold, blind chance, and there's probably no final judgment or rescue coming. Is that good news? I wonder how you talk to yourself in the midst of your suffering. I wonder what stories you tell yourself in your suffering. No matter what you think you ought to say or what you ought to think, no matter what you know, I wonder, do the thoughts in your head talk more like Henley here or more like Jesus? Which of the two present a better truth when it comes to suffering? Last week in John chapter 8, we talked about what it meant when Jesus declared that he was the light of the world. And now as we turn the page to chapter 9, we're really on the same subject. We're not changing subjects at all. We find that this theme of light, Jesus as the light of the world, continues all through the chapter. You can see for yourself in verse 5 that Jesus has not dropped the theme of Light And as the light of the world, Jesus reveals exactly the way that we should think about our suffering. He reveals God's will. He reveals God's power toward our suffering. He sheds light on the way we should speak about our suffering. And so that's the goal today. I want to give you three lessons from Jesus on suffering, three ways in which he, as the light of the world, sheds light on the way we should think about and talk about our suffering. So let me read the first seven verses, chapter 9, and then pray. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming. When no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Let's pray. Father and God, that we would come back from this seeing is our prayer. May we see May we see Jesus, may we see the light of the world, and having seen Jesus, know exactly what to make of our suffering, what to think about it, what to say about it, and how to live in the light of Christ on this side of eternity. Give us open hearts and open eyes, in Jesus' name, amen. So. Three lessons on suffering. Three ways Jesus sheds light on our suffering. Number one. Number one is that God reigns over all suffering. God reigns over all suffering. So the disciples are famously picked on for this passage, and we are fond of pointing out what buffoons the disciples were and could be. And this is one of those occasions where the disciples are famously wrong about yet one more thing. But they're right about one thing, and that's what a lot of people miss. Uh, they're right about one thing that a lot of people miss. So though they are wrong about what role sin plays 
in this man's situation, this man's suffering, at least they want to factor God into the equation, right? They, they can't imagine a scenario where God isn't some part of the explanation for this man's suffering. Now, moderns, on the other hand, in a well-intentioned effort to absolve God from any potential guilt or blame, as if God needs us to rush to his aid, actually fail to factor God into the equation of our suffering at all. We say God has nothing to do with this man's suffering because we want it to not be his fault, and so we factor him out of the equation entirely. But this is explicitly not the case here in chapter 9, and it's not really the case anywhere else. So, again, the disciples are dead wrong as this man's suffering being a punishment from God for a particular sin, whether it's his or their parents, but they're not wrong that God has something to do with this whole situation. The ultimate explanation for the man's suffering is God. Now, don't misunderstand this. We are not talking about a bloodthirsty sky bully who is highly enjoying himself as he imagines all kinds of personal tortures for us. Rather, we are simply affirming what the Bible says clearly, that God works out, quote, all things according to the counsel of his will. That's Ephesians 1.11, that God works out all things according to the counsel of of his own will. Nothing happens outside of his ordaining hand. There's a subtle hint to this theme in the previous chapter also. You might remember that last week as we considered chapter 8 that Jesus says several times, I am he. I am he. You need to believe that I am he. And we saw how Jesus borrowed that language directly from God's own speech in Deuteronomy 32, Jesus borrows that speech of God to basically tell us that he himself is the God of Deuteronomy, the God that delivered Israel from Egypt. And what this God says about himself is this, quote, I, even I am he. So you can see the, the connection there. God in Deuteronomy 32 saying to Israel, I am he, Jesus in John 8, I am he, but Jesus borrowing from Deuteronomy 32, this is what God says of himself. I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. The Bible's not shy about this. Nothing happens outside of God's ordaining hand. This, of course, raises a thousand questions. The most famous is posed as a philosophical problem, often called the problem of evil. It goes like this. If God was all-powerful, then he could just end all evil and suffering. But he doesn't. So he must not be a good God because an all-powerful God that was good would do just that. If he was all good, but he doesn't end all suffering. Maybe he's not all-powerful. But we must choose, so the objection goes. We must choose. The God of the Christian Bible, who is all-good and all-powerful, can't exist. He can be all-powerful, but if suffering doesn't end, then he can't be all-good because he must not want to do anything about it. Maybe he does want to do something about it, but he can't, and therefore he's not all-powerful. So he must choose one or the other. He can't be both, and the problem of evil and suffering proves it. There was even a mainstream superhero movie not that, uh, not that long ago where the villain is, is repeating this same philosophical problem, and of course it sounds really deep and, and intellectual. And there is a way to meditate on this problem and sound really intelligent and thoughtful. But there's just a few problems with it. Let me give you a couple of, of examples of the problems with it. First, just because you can't think of a good reason for an all-good and an all-powerful God to allow evil and suffering doesn't mean there isn't a good reason. In 
In fact, if you're honest about your limitations, you have to admit that there could be a lot of reasons that you are simply not going to be able to know right away for God to allow evil and suffering. I think we just have to admit this as, as a, a, a feature of our human nature. Not a bug, a feature. Another problem with this philosophy is that to defend this logic, you have to assume that as a finite, limited, fragile human creature, you are the one who knows exactly how and when God should wield his power against evil and suffering. We, we sit with, with our limited view and our limited capacities and our limited wisdom and then turn around and act as if we know when and how God should act in the world toward evil and suffering. You have to assume that God's biggest problem is that he didn't seek your counsel when choosing how and when to act. There are more problems that come with this philosophy, but I think those are two of the biggest. In any case, this logic is obliterated and this debate is ultimately settled, not by worldly wisdom, not even by religious, particularly religious wisdom, but rather settled by the incarnation of the Son of God. The fact that God became flesh and suffered, the fact that God became flesh and died for evil men puts this problem in a whole new light. So think about it this way. As God ordained all things that come to pass, he did not ordain a world where he would look down on all the suffering like a cold and calculating chess player. He ordained a story where he himself would enter in. He wrote a play where the author takes the stage. He enters his own story. He ordained a world where, rather than remaining distant from our pain and suffering, he comes close. In fact, here in John 9, he's able to pass by. He's able to see. He's able to stop and intervene. We know that this is not happenstance or random chance as Jesus passes by. It's a great example of one of the main reasons for God himself to enter into history at all. It is one of the main responses of God himself to human evil and suffering. And so even if we never arrive at all the reasons for our particular sufferings, we know that we can rule out at least one significant thing. We can rule out that God is indifferent. We can rule out that he's disinterested in wielding his power against evil and suffering because with unbelievable strength, he remained on a Roman cross to die and take the punishment for your evil. And to rise from the dead, to purchase a world with no more suffering, we can know with just as much power in his restraint, he's given us centuries of time and patience to see the light and turn from our evil and trust him. And that's a much better alternative. Because really, like, what is the alternative story to that? What's the alternative to God reigning over human suffering in that way? The alternatives are not good. The alternative is that your suffering is basically out of God's hands, that he dropped the ball, that Satan is just as or more powerful, or worse, that your suffering takes place in a world where God has no power over it and may even be meaningless. And that's not good news. That's not even a good story. What is a good story? Well, that's lesson two and three. So, number, lesson number one is that God reigns over all suffering and he is the explanation ultimately for all of it, though that introduces us to mysteries, we can affirm clearly that God ordains all things according to the counsel of his will and that he is supreme over our suffering. But lesson two is this, that God does not waste our suffering, that God does not waste our suffering. In verse three, Jesus answered, it was not, this, this, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So the disciples want to have one kind of explanation for suffering. It's a little bit better than Henley's uh, explanation for suffering, but it's still not quite right. And Jesus says, no, he, here, this is what's going on. This man is in the situation he's in so that the works of God might be displayed in him. 
the works of God. So here Jesus corrects his disciples' understanding. What he explains is that this man's suffering is an occasion for the works of God. And the implication then is that this man's situation ultimately exists for the glory of God. Consider what this story comes to demonstrate. So here, because of his healing, we see again that Jesus is God, the Son sent from the Father. He, he explains to his disciples that the work that he's about to do is the Father's work. He, notice how he turns, from, he, he, he turns from talking about his works and the works that his Father wants to do to actually working a healing on this, on this blind man. And so he explains that he's doing his Father's work and then he does his Father's work, which means Jesus is doing only what the Father can do. Jesus is doing only what God can do. Jesus is God the Son sent from the Father. This work demonstrates the compassion and power and purpose of this heavenly Father in turning this man's blindness to sight. And maybe most significantly, it shows that Jesus will be known as a God over men, not a man under men. And you'll notice, for example, this is another healing that Jesus performs on yet another Sabbath day, which violated the man-made traditions of the Pharisees and highly agitates the Pharisees. But Jesus doesn't do it to get them agitated. He doesn't do it to get a rise out of them. He does it to show them who's in charge. And this all works out for the glory of Jesus as he makes himself known as God over men by this act. The man himself that is healed, we'll read next week, comes to believe in Christ through this and worship him as God. The resurrection of Lazarus, you might remember, happens for the same purpose. In John 11.4, Jesus says of Lazarus, Lazarus, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And this is the scriptural witness everywhere also. That God superintends our suffering for his glory and his good purposes. In Romans 8, 20 through 21, we read that it is God who subjected this world to the consequences of our sin, which leads to a futility. And that futility is imposed on us by God, but it's a kind of futility that alerts us to our need and calls us to hope in the only one that can deliver us from our sin. The scriptures say in 2 Corinthians 4 that God has imposed all this on us that he might outweigh it all with his glory in eternity. That his own glory compared to our sufferings in this life will have been of no comparison. That our suffering will be light and momentary compared to the glory of God we see on that day. That God's glory will swallow up our misery and we will consider our sufferings light and momentary. James 1.3 tells us that our present afflictions test the allegiance of our heart and they train us to endure with single-minded devotion to the Lord. They reveal whether or not we are torn between two masters or whether we're going to chase after God in our sufferings or chase after the world in our sufferings. And Romans 5.15 says that our, in our suffering we can rejoice. And can, we can rejoice because as they give us occasions to look back on the cross and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that one thing our sufferings do not mean is that God hates us because we can look at the cross and know that Jesus died for us and he can't and he won't take that love back. God does not waste our suffering. God is at work in all of our suffering to do things that we will thank him and praise him for forever. Joni Erickson Tata, who many of you may have heard of, has famously said that she hopes she can take her wheelchair to heaven just for a little bit so that she can look at that wheelchair and say to Jesus, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for that wheelchair. 
you were right. You were right when you said that in this world we would have trouble because that wheelchair was a lot of trouble. But you know, the more trouble I had from that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. For suffering to be totally absent in our lives is to lack a full demonstration of God's power and compassion and mercy. As he's patiently changing us to reflect more and more the character of his son. Uh, I have a friend named John. Not the John that, that you guys know from Nebraska. Another friend, um, John. He lives up north in Minnesota. This passage is really special to him because um, his firstborn son, Paulie, wasn't simply born blind. He was born with no eyes. As they, uh, they the, the doctors held him for the first time, they knew immediately something was dramatically wrong. Not only does he not have eyes, he has autism, developmental problems. As he's gotten older, they've discovered a, a condition that gives him chronic seizures. So much of, much of little Polly's life was spent in and out of doctor's offices, in and out of hospitals, having multiple procedures and, and surgeries. And my friend John would tell you that until Polly was born, he thought he was a Christian. And then he had Paul that he would, he would sit in his living room with friends from his church. Friends that were just there to love him and comfort him and show him compassion. And he would look them in the eye and he would say, our God is mean. Our God is cruel. A monster. And do you want the proof? He's playing on the living room floor. One day, Polly would have to have yet one more of his procedures. And in the providence of God, they were assigned a surgeon who was brand new and had never worked with Polly before and, in fact, was brand new to the hospital, didn't even know his way around the building. And as they're wheeling Polly to surgery on one of those beds and the surgeon is leading the way, John is bringing up the rear and the doctor takes a wrong turn and John says, Doctor, no! You're going the wrong way. And the surgeon says, no, I'm not. I know where I'm going. He's like, you really don't. You're going the wrong way. We just spent hours getting my boy ready for surgery. And if we don't get him into surgery now, we, we have wasted all of this time. And you're going down the wrong way. John would recount to me that this guy was also young, which didn't help John's feelings toward this guy at all. And he was like, what is this young, stupid doctor doing, taking him the wrong way. I've been in this hospital more than he has, and now he's taking my boy the wrong way, and we're going to miss our window for surgery. And John recounted to me one time, he's like, there was a point, he's like, Look, I was about to boil over. And he said, I had it in my head. We're walking down the hallway. He's not listening to me. I already don't like him. I'm already mad at God. I'm already in pain because of what my son is going through. And it just, it was there. He's like, I heard my own voice in my head as I looked at this doctor. I am going to kill this man. I am going to kill him. I am going to jump him and throttle him to death. And then John said, next voice I heard said, and that's how wicked you are, John. That's how sinful you are. In that moment, John realized he'd never been a Christian. He'd never really loved and worshipped the Lord. He'd never really been a good person. But with his son, Polly, God gave John the gift of seeing the depths of his own murderous black heart and was rescued from his own sin and darkness. Paul has grown now. 
and his issues are just as bad as they ever were. But now, he has a daddy who loves Jesus. And he loves Jesus, too. Now, the story, that story, would not have been the story John would have written for himself. But it's a better one. No one is held in awe of God because there are people everywhere praising him for their comfortable lives. People marvel at God because of how brightly he shines in our darkness and our suffering and how he doesn't waste a bit of it. Lesson three. God proves his wisdom in suffering. God not only, he will not only wa not waste our suffering, he will prove his wisdom in our suffering. In verse 6, Jesus famously spits in the dirt, makes mud, and then smears that mud on the man's eyes. Various explanations for why Jesus did this are suggested. Some think it's possible that Jesus makes this mud or clay because he is the potter, we are the clay. Uh, he's creator, we are creation, and Jesus is making new creation eyes for this man. Uh, yet others think that Jesus is just really sticking it to the Pharisees here, uh, that making mud on the Sabbath would have been a violation of their traditions. Uh, still others think this was some an ancient home remedy uh, for blindness. Um, apparently, word of mouth was that you could spread saliva on the, the eyes of a newborn baby who was having trouble seeing, and, and they would be healed. And so the assumption here is that Jesus is, um, this man being born blind, uh, Jesus is basically giving him new birth by treating him like a, a newborn baby. Well, r regardless, um, most commentators admit that we really don't know why Jesus uses the mud. And, and I actually kind of like not knowing why. I, I, think, uh, I think not knowing why is kind of the point. Um, or maybe to say it this way, we could say actually the point is to see this, see him make mud and spread this over the eyes of this blind man and, and have this reaction like, huh? Like, what, what, kind of, what kind of sense does this make? Why does Jesus do this? I, I think we're actually meant to see that it is somewhat senseless. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to defy any kind of worldly wise explanations because the Bible is absolutely chock full of God saving in ways that don't make sense to us. One famous example would be in the book of Joshua, where the walls of Jericho come crashing down. You might remember Jericho was a military stronghold that was keeping Israel from entering into the promised land, and God's strategy for breaking its walls was to have them walk around it for a few days while playing the trumpet. Now imagine being in that strategy meeting. Right? This would be like a quarterback in the huddle with the game on the line and seconds to go and all of his team looking to him for direction. And in all of his years of leadership experience on the field, he looks at his team and says, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to win. We're going to get the marching band in here. Uh, maybe that would work in Nebraska. I don't think they've tried that yet. They've tried everything else. But... It doesn't make sense, right? Like, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's not a sensible plan, but it works, doesn't it? It works. Those walls came down. And it works because God does not want his people explaining how it works by pointing at themselves. He wants them winning the day in a way that keeps us from boasting in ourselves. And this is exactly why we have the cross of Christ. The fall of Jericho, Gideon's 300, shepherds slaying giants, all point to the most surprising method of God's deliverance, the cross of Christ. Just listen to Paul expound on this in 1 Corinthians. Just let this wash over you. He says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. 
Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. So, here it is, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. The great shock about the light of the world in John is that after being sent, it would be extinguished on a Roman cross. That the day of his appearing would end in darkness that was as black as night. No one thought this was wisdom. Because virtually no one realized that there's something worse than suffering in this world. And that's us. Rebels, sinners, lovers of self, proud of our sins. No one thought this was wisdom because we thought all we needed was just a little help, a little tweak, not a full-blown rescue and resuscitation. But God has been wiser. And so the greatest occasion of suffering ever to be Ever to take place under the sun, the greatest occasion of suffering in history, the death of God's own son, turned out to be the greatest work of God ever performed so that you, can, you and I can have the greatest boast known to man. The greatest suffering was the greatest work of God so that we can have the greatest boast. If God has done this on a universal and grand scale, it is nothing for him. It is nothing for him to turn your suffering into your boasting. So one application, one takeaway from this as we, as we finish. I just, what, all I've got is one, one application, and I want to give you examples of it, but all I've got is one main application in light of the fact that God is supreme over our suffering, that he doesn't waste any of our suffering, and that he makes his wisdom known in our suffering. So the application is this. We must speak to ourselves in suffering rather than listen to ourselves. We must speak to ourselves in suffering rather than listen to ourselves. We must speak the word of God to ourselves, teach ourselves, talk to ourselves in our suffering. And we must do this because if we don't tell ourselves the word of God, we will listen to our own hearts and our own hearts are idiots. That's the theological term. So talk to yourself. Tell yourself the truth of God's word so that your own heart doesn't drown out the truths that will give you endurance and joy and rejoicing in suffering. So let me give you two examples. I think I only wrote two. Eh, we'll see. Two or so <laughs> examples of what you should say to yourself in suffering. First, you need to speak to yourself about the ultimate reason for your suffering. One of the things you need to tell yourself as you speak to yourself in suffering is about the ultimate reason for your suffering. So you should remember those verses that I listed earlier and that are in your bulletin. Memorize those. Put those on your heart. At least know the basic point of those so you can go back to them and you can rehearse them in your heart so that when you're in your 90s, and you're wondering, why has God kept me around for so long? What use am I? You can tell yourself on those days, you know what, I'm here that the works of God might be displayed in me. You can tell yourself, I'm, I'm, I'm 95 today, 
so that the works of God might be displayed in me. It is God that has kept my faith secure all these years, and I am an example of the Lord's faithfulness to preserve faith in his people. And this will encourage younger generations of Christians to know that it's possible to hang on to your faith in, in your final years. So-called Pride Month, right? So another thing you might be considering this month is the people in your life that have wildly different views on sexuality or wildly different behaviors, and, and you're asking why. I mean, we ask that question all the time in our sufferings and in our troubles and our anxieties. Why, God? Why? Right? And if, if these people are your children or your siblings or your parents, you're probably asking, why, why does it have to be this way? What? Why can't it be different? Well, we don't have to know all the reasons why, but we can tell ourselves one of the reasons why is so that the works of God might be displayed in you toward them. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be a person in the lives of those people that models both a happy submission to God's word and a deep and abiding love for those people that are so different than we are. Or you may have endured great loss and wonder why, why have I had to lose so much? Here's why. It's so that the works of God would be displayed in you. That you, by the sufficient grace of Jesus, may learn to treasure the Lord above all worldly treasures and provoke people to ask about the hope within you and hear of the hope of Christ within you and find themselves receiving eternal life. So you need to tell yourself frequently about the reason for all your suffering, that it is that the works of God might be displayed in you so that you will know how to speak in these different areas. Another example of something you need to tell yourself in suffering is that suffering is not just about me. It's not about me. Suffering is actually meant to equip you in ways that make you a comfort to others. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 that he praises God for his sufferings because they enable him to suffer in ways that other people suffer and the Lord's comforts allow him to comfort others who suffer in the same way that he's received comfort from the Lord. Many times, most of what we need as sufferers is somebody to be with us who can legitimately say, I know, I know people who have come through the same kinds of suffering who can stand on the shore and call out to the sufferer that they need not drown in their sorrows. So we need to talk to ourselves about the real reason for our suffering. We need to talk to ourselves about how our suffering, it's not just about us, it's not just about me. It is so that I might be a comfort to others who've suffered as I have. So don't talk to yourself or don't listen to yourself. Talk to yourself. And when you talk, make sure it's God's truth that you are telling yourself. Well, we started with a poem. Let's end with one. This one is by Edward Shalito. And you can listen here for how it reminds us that ultimately... In our suffering, we don't need a plan. We don't need a step-by-step -step process. We don't need a philosophy. We don't need coffee cup wisdom. We need a person. We need a person. We need a savior and a God who knows our suffering truly and came out the other side. This is how it goes. This is at least a part of it. Our wounds are hurting us. Where is the balm? Lord Jesus, by thy scars we claim thy grace. If when the doors are shut, thou drawest near, only reveal those hands, that side of thine. We know today what wounds are. Have no fear. Show us thy scars. We know the countersign. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we thank you for your son.
and for his wounds. But in his side and on his hands and on his feet, he bears the signs that he suffered with us and for us. And he did it in a way that has absolutely liberated us from our punishment, from our sin, from our condemnation. And so for his wounds, we give you thanks. Not only because we know we have a Savior in heaven who can legitimately say he knows what we suffer, but because we have a Savior in heaven whose scars preach our rescue. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a good note to, uh, to end on, that we have hope in Christ, that suffering is not the end of our story, and actually the end of our story is resurrection, and so long for that day. So, happy Father's Day to all of you. I pray that it's a sweet and blessed day full of good memories and lots of reasons to thank the Lord for His grace uh, to you, both in the fathers that you've had and the fathers that you are. Let this be a good word for us as we go. <clears throat> From 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. God bless you as you go.